Welcome to Dark Dive, a Hellbent Holler podcast. I'm your host, Jesse. This is Joe. And today we are going into something that we know a little bit about backwoods cults and feral humans. So let's get started and let's take the dark dive. You are listening to Dark Dive. Welcome to the show, everybody. We are so excited to have you here. And today is kind of a weird episode. Um, It's not exactly cryptids and it's not exactly ghosts. It's something a little more human or almost human, I guess. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Through the course of doing the kind of work that we do, we run across a lot of strange instances in the woods that cannot be attributed to cryptids or paranormal activity but actual human activity and some of it is pretty nefarious Um, we're talking today about backwoods cults and feral humans those are those things that are hiding in the woods that are relics of another time and they are quite frightening sometimes Mm -hmm. you know the whole idea that there's little forgotten pockets of people scattered around this region it's it's really not that hard to believe no you know? not at all um and the fact that there might be some sort of semi-organized cult activity going on up in these mountains as well it's also not that hard to believe and we're talking something that goes a little bit beyond just your average teenage metalhead you know who maybe plays a little bit too much D D. or spray paints on an overpass yeah you know? we're talking like uh actual organized family-based cult activity yeah absolutely absolutely um and it's it's like he said it it is not hard to believe that there are actually feral humans that are still living in the mountains that are relics of another time like i said before um that they just went up in the woods maybe they checked out of society or maybe they have been up there this whole time maybe they just never left that they're up there, they've been up there, they've been surviving off the land, and they've kind of reverted back to nature. So we'll get into that too. But we're going to start out with backwoods cults. And Joe and I have actually had run-ins with some cults before and been around these areas that we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. And it's just as scary as some nine-foot-tall upright canid. You know, if you have groups of people performing rituals in the woods and you don't know what they're getting up to. So that's just as scary to me as something like the dog man or something like a Sasquatch. So um, we'll start out with a place that we've actually been, uh, Corpsewood Manor. We didn't make it all Mm -hmm. the way there, but we'll get into that (laughs) after I give you a little background on the story. So in 1976, Loyola Chicago professor Charles Scudder um, left the university he was about to retire and he sold his mansion that he had up there and wanted to kind of retire and live a simpler life. So he and his longtime partner, Joseph Odom, packed everything up and Charles purchased some land down in Chattooga County, Georgia. And it was about 40 acres. And they wanted to go down there and basically live off the land, build a house, and just kind of live in peace for the rest of their days. But these weren't really just normal, peaceful homesteaders. These are not your typical homesteader, no. Um, Charles was actually the head of Loyola University Chicago Institute for Mind, Drugs, and Behavior. And that was the... That was the department that was actually involved in MK Ultra for a long time. MK Ultra did a lot of mind control experiments. They used torture, coercion, um, involuntary drug use, and it was it was just a way for them to test the effects of these things on the human psyche and see how they could use that as a weapon as a weapon 
within the U.S. government against foreign um against you know foreign adversaries and everything but it was also used there's a i could do a whole episode on mk ultra to be honest with you but we're just going to kind of skim over it mk ultra was bad news and it's probably still going on to this day so he was involved in that project pretty extensively he did a lot of work with mind altering drugs specifically lsd when joseph and charles moved down to north georgia they had with them 12,000 hits of LSD, two human skulls, and their beloved mastiffs, Beelzebub and Arsenath. So if those names kind of raise a little alarm or a red flag, it's because Charles was actually a card-carrying member of the Church of Satan. So these two are pretty interesting characters, Where right? did he get the bones at? Where did he get the skulls at? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. He... I'm- did Maybe, he steal them from the college? He probably up, stole them from the college. I would. Okay. I hope he stole them from the. I hope he stole them from the college. Because I just I've seen the stories and they always talk about how he moved down and he just had these human bones like in his possession. Yeah. Um, but they I never have, quite say where he got them at. So. Right. I I really hope that he um, just stole them from the. I hope he stole them department. from so, yeah. Loyola. Yeah. Let's let's hope for that. <clears throat> so they packed everything up. They sold everything they had, all their furniture or whatever they had. And they sold everything. He had an old decaying mansion uh, downtown in Chicago, sold that. He got um, a bit of a uh, payout from a life insurance policy. So he took all that money and he bought just this chunk of land in Chattooga County, Georgia, on the side of a mountain. It was about 40 acres and it was in a rough, rough area. It's very difficult to get to. So you have to take a mountain road to actually get up to it. When they arrived at the property, there was a dead horse on the side of the road, right at the little turnoff where you go to where they were going to build their homestead. And so that's how their little homestead road got called Dead Horse Road. Um, and it was kind of a, they, they, they said it was a grim and cheerful and delightful omen. So that's how it was mm-hmm. described. So Dead Horse Road. So they go there and they start construction on their house, their their satanic sex castle, basically. <laughs> um, so they built the house brick by brick. It was in an oval shape, and that was said to that was said to be an oval shape. The reason he did that is when you have a home in the shape of a circle or an oval, there are no corners in the house for spirits to hide. Um, they built it brick by brick, just those two. There was no running water, no electricity. And on one side of the house, there was a large stained glass window of Baphomet. So this is just, like I said, a satanic sex castle. We're mm-hmm. going to get into that. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the home itself, they had a gazebo, um, a well house, and what's known as the chicken coop. The chicken coop was a three-story structure, and on the top level, that was only accessible by ladder, so you could remove the ladder if you wanted to. Again, this is three stories up, was something called the pink room. Now, the pink room was an interesting little um, hideaway where they had pornography. um, They would make homemade wine and take it up there. There were mattresses everywhere. It was kind of just their little... Uh, chill, their their Netflix and chill of 1980. You know. Now Scudder was a professor, correct? He was a and professor. And then Odom was a janitor at the same college. Correct? No, uh, Odom was actually his housekeeper. His housekeeper, but okay. he but was they actually were lovers as well. Yeah, though. Okay, yeah. So, so. Um, I mean, again, this is 19. They moved up in 1976. So. Um, I, being gay at that time is not quite as acceptable as it is now. So I'm sure he wasn't his housekeeper. I mean, he was his lover. He was his, his partner. And um, But still, everything I read said that when they first moved there and began construction of their home, they were just so unobtrusive that the locals didn't really care. The that, lo- they, no. that they were, at first, just the locals were just pretty much just didn't give a flip that these guys were over here and what they were doing. It right. wasn't until later that they started to... Right. Pay attention, um, because so. they were way up on the mountain. They yeah. were not living in town or anything like that. They would come to town for supplies very, 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 very rarely. And they would come down, get supplies, take them right up back the mountain. They pretty much kept to themselves most of the time. Until um, a few of the local teens started going up there, uh, mostly young men. And Charles made his own homemade wine. And he would 
supply these young teens with wine and often LSD and get up to a little tomfoolery in the old... Um, a little tomfoolery. A little tomfoolery yeah, right. up in the old pink room. So um, the locals didn't really handle that very well. They didn't really like that very much. And um, there's a lot of different stories about, you know, how they perceive them. A lot of times, uh, if, if you ask a local about that area or where the, the Corpsewood Manor is, it's referred to by the locals as Devil Worshippers Mountain. Mm-hmm. So it was commonly known amongst the locals that they did participate in satanic rituals. So they, as soon as that started coming out and then the teen boys were going up there and uh, getting into the tomfoolery. There were a lot of dead animals showing up on yes. the uh, Dead Horse Road, is that what it was called? Dead so, Horse Road is where their um, mm-hmm. house was, but the, the Mountain View Road and the Narrows Road that lead up to there, there were a lot of dead animals showing up kind of in that area. And that was a, an area where people would go and picnic and kind of, mm-hmm. cause it's up on a ridge. The they ain't picnic in there now. So yeah. No, I mean, definitely yeah. not. But uh, yeah, I remember reading some of the stories that were talking about how animal deaths started to increase. Yeah. And people's pets there. were going missing. Yeah. Um, that was, that was something that was going on and kind of ramping up as this kind of progressed. Is that the two of them you wonder, or is that something that they may be, that they may be kind of drew in with their occult practices. I don't know. I don't know. Um, So 1982, fast forward here a little bit to 1982. uh, That's when everything kind of comes to a head. They had hung out with this young gentleman and his friend, and then one of them brought a girlfriend, and they hung out, and the stories are kind of convoluted about what happened, but one guy eventually showed back up with a rifle, and allegedly his plan was to rob them because they lived in this big brick house they did have fine furniture um but they they lived a very simple life they lived a very they didn't have any money i mean they anything they had had already gone into the place so they had nothing um but he came to rob them because he assumed that they had money stashed away the guy uh shot the dogs he shot charles shot joseph killed them all and then set fire to the house. Um, there was a manhunt for this guy for a while, and they eventually tracked him down and arrested him. So that's the long and short of the Corpsewood Manor story. So that's what kind of brought us to go there. There's still a bit of ruins left of the house there on the side of the mountain. So we were like, let's go check it out. Well, let's remember, we first started getting like Bigfoot and Dogman reports in that area. Yeah. And yeah. then that we started looking at that area, and then we realized, forget the Bigfoot and Dogman reports. What is this Corpsewood Manor? Yeah, there's a satanic seeing? sex castle that was burned by yeah. <laughs> murderers in the late in the early <laughs> '80s. So we're like, let's go check this out. Now, right near there is a uh, like a wildlife management area and a national forest where there has been a lot of bodies found, and I do mean like a an ordinate amount of bodies found and people have gone in there and suicided themselves yeah said so, uh, like on several occasions and it seems to be a body dump for well, i guess local criminals because dead dead humans are found there all the time yeah and then dead livestock dead anything it just seems like that anything that goes into that patch of woods ends up dead right so naturally we decided we'd go into that patch of woods so we went up there. It was uh, it was summer. It was really hot. We mm-hmm. took that drive. It's a long drive for us to get there. So we finally got there. And when we turned down onto the main road to go up the mountain, we pulled over um, to to kind of get our, our bearings about us. We pulled over. Uh, we get out of the car. And as soon as we get out of the car, right there on the side of the road, um, kind of back near towards like a creek where we walked through the woods a little bit and like near a creek there was just a pile of dead deer and i know that when a lot of hunters will go hunting they'll you know clean their kill and you know or cut off the heads or you know something like that you know and then just dump the bodies so you'll find bone piles in areas where people go hunting all the time this was not that these were like fully intact there's there's deer with antlers and everything just in a pile just in a pile there yeah when we say that they were just mostly bones although there was still a little bit of flesh left on the bones there but yeah i mean they're just piled up we counted what like four or five yeah it was was such a jumble you couldn't tell otherwise though but it was it struck me as odd because if if you have a hunter going up there just to do some poaching or anything like that they'll 
I mean, they'll do a they'll body dump on the deer, you know, but they'll cut the head off usually if it's got. Especially a, if there's a rack. Yeah, yeah, but there was yeah yeah, and the, but that was not the case with this. I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. That's our first. That's our first weird thing of the day. All right, let's go up this dark road up into the mountains and check this out. So we start climbing the mountain and uh, taking this just really rough gravel road up that way. And we finally get up there. It's just getting darker and creepier the further we go. And there's just this weird, ominous feeling out there. It was the surrounding area, too. Remember, it's it's mostly farmland. Yes. So there's there's homes within a few miles of there, but they're very spread out. They're not next to the road. Um, it's just a very isolated place when you go up in yes, there. Yes, it is very isolated. It is very isolated. Um, and, and, you know, usually during the summer, stuff is not, like, super creepy. I think the winter makes things look creepier because mm-hmm. everything's dead and falling apart. But it, it, this was the middle of the summer, and it was just absolutely just creepy. So we get up there, and we kind of pull off the side of the road on this like closed down kind of little road there. Yeah, because there's old logging roads up there oh, yeah. that are not maintained. So uh, when we went up, we didn't take a four wheel drive. We we took our Subaru because it it's was gonna be- It's all wheel drive. Well, it's, <laughs> it because it was gonna be a really long drive. Um, and when we read about this place, we read that there were roads up there, but they're they're not maintained at all. Right. They're even rougher than the roads where we usually go to in North Georgia mm-hmm. that are not maintained. Um, to the point of you'd see like old uh, forestry road gates that were like locked off and everything, but then you couldn't even tell that there was a road there because yeah. it was just so covered with just debris from the forest and all that. So it's definitely been somewhere that whatever was going on as far as civilization goes came to a screeching halt after oh, these yeah. dudes, um, yeah. you know, were killed up there. So uh, we park, get everything together. As soon as we get out of the car, though, um, we kind of go down one of these little logging roads a little ways. And there we found a fire ring where somebody had set a fire and was burning something. Um, And we found pet carriers. Empty pet carriers. Empty pet carriers, yes. A few of them. Mm -hmm. Um, So what it looked to be from you know drawing conclusions there looks like somebody was taking animals up there and wasn't planning on taking them back Back, so it looks like there is satanic activity and possible animal sacrifice going on right up until this day well that was one of the things we saw is that somebody had said in a comment section that because of the history of the place regardless of what these two guys were were or weren't involved with, that it's basically like a mecca for, for people who are involved in the occult nowadays yes. in this region. And so we read that, and then we got up there and saw these pet carriers. And we're like, well, like you said, somebody brought animals up here, but they didn't They didn't they leave didn't with them. They didn't take them back, yeah. Um, and we found a few of those. We found that what looked like a, I thought it was fabric, like upholstery from maybe an old couch or something like that at first. And then it ended up, possibly being a dress we saw found the remnants it, of that red and white dress it up there. looked like a child's costume is yeah. what it looked like <clears throat> yeah so, yeah 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 this is some we're we're getting into some nefarious territory here um we've got evidence of possible animal sacrifice we've got children's costumes kind of strewn about and there's you know unknown blood-like substances on them. Yeah, it, it was it just, was, um, and the whole area just felt, we get into pr- some pretty sketchy areas. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I still stand by it that this was, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the sketchiest area we've ever been into. Oh, yeah. It's hot, you don't hear anything, there's no, the woods are just dead silent, it stinks. Oh, it there. smelled, oh, I was about to say that, I was about to say, oh my God, and it smelled awful. Like, it smells like rotting flesh. It smells like a decaying corpse up there. Um, so I'm not surprised they call it Corpsewood Manor yeah, in that it's, area. Yeah, it's just the smell of, like, rot. Um, and we even walked around a little bit to see if maybe, you know, you're on Dead Horse Road where their first, you know, introduction to the place was finding a dead horse there. Yeah. And then there's all these rumors of just animals being found dead and people being found dead. So we kind of even walked around to see what's rotting up there. We could never find anything. Yeah, but. and there's just this sickly sweet smell of yeah. like death and dying and decay there. It was it was startling, I'd mm-hmm. say, um, just to say the least. And we get into some pretty dangerous situations on a regular basis. But going up there and experiencing that was, um, that was a whole other level, I think. Um, 
so we keep going down the road there's abandoned equipment up there where they tried to do uh, some logging a little bit i mean it looks like you know probably thousands and thousands of dollars oh, tens of thousands we've, worth of uh logging equipment that is just abandoned there tires going flat it's so it's just, been there it's for a while out. just looks like that they we found flatbed trucks filled up with downed trees um and it just looks like they just walked away one day and never came back from yeah, it. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're traveling down. We're walk we have to walk down the road because the road is so rough at this point. We had to par park our car over by the near the, where the animal sacrifices are. Yeah, so. near the empty pet carriers. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Where'd you leave the car? Oh, is it you know row six? B, no, it's next Damn. to the animal sacrifices. That's where we left the car. And when we say the roads are bad, I mean, the roads are bad. I don't even know if you could, in some places, you can't even call it a road anymore. No, um, There's no. trees growing up from where they cleared it. The, the forest is starting to encroach back in. Um, you can't call them potholes. There's just... They're like two and three feet deep. Deep, yeah. Just divots I mean, in the just road. Just divots where the, the water has eroded. And and like I said, it's just, it's, it's and the whole time, it's just, you're, you're smelling just this rot yeah yes it's it i don't know how many red flags we have to have before we're like okay time to go home but you're seeing spray paint <laughs> like on the trees oh yeah, yeah you're seeing like satanic symbols spray painted on the trees everywhere mm -hmm. um so we keep traveling down and then this car this car so comes we, up the road well, we we're going we hear something because we're on we're on complete <laughs> like edge at this point and when i say the road has got and it's like just deep holes in it and we start hearing something, and then I'm like, is that a vehicle? And then ahead of us, around the bend, comes this... It was like a Toyota Corolla. It was like an early 90s Toyota Corolla that looks like it came out of a demolition derby. Just trashed all to just I hell, mean, all so. the windows were busted. And I mean, when I say... No all the, license plate. No so license plate. Well, I don't nothing. think you could put a plate on that thing. But, yeah. um, like, all the windows were busted out. Like, there's jagged glass and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's four people in this thing, and they're just driving up this road dragging on the bottom of it you yeah know, and i'm like there's no way that these people are gonna how have they not gotten stuck and they're just they're just navigating up through man, yeah so. and then they drive past us and like we kind of wave at them being kind of friendly i guess and they all just glared at us like all of their heads turned at the same time to glare at yeah, us it was yeah. just that you know that it was like in a movie where just everybody goes glares at you as you go by um we're like oh god <laughs> okay great another red flag perfect so we hike on down a little bit further and they were and let's let's not bypass them because they looked creepy as they looked out. creepy yes um, we're not exactly normal people no. by any stretch of the imaginations <laughs> in case you couldn't tell um so it's not like we just see somebody wearing all black and we just start flipping out or you know um, they've got tattoos were, or something yeah yeah exactly oh my lord he's got a tattoo but uh, these people they looked off they looked they, off yeah they looked like there was a certain degree of inbreeding going on um let's just call it it's it nothing like super severe but you can tell you know yeah, what i'm saying i mean yeah. we, we've lived in this region you know our whole lives this could know, have been a big bridge for the feral people there but yeah <laughs> it could be but um and they just i mean when i say just this blank kind of just but just a glare glare yeah. yeah and they all moved in kind of almost unison it's yeah just they the did. Weirdest thing. And so. but we uh we we kept traveling on and then then we started seeing like toilets off the side of the road yeah, yeah which was weird because it's so difficult to get up there yeah it was really hard to get up there but somebody's taking the time to take their old toilet and take it up to the top of the mountain and dump it off and there's like a few of them like a lot yeah yeah and it's if you go into like even the lbl you'll see where people have gone in there and dumped trash before. Mm -hmm. yeah um especially in these like national forests or parks or whatever that have a lot of rural communities around them sometimes they just use it as a garbage dump yeah but yeah. it's so difficult to get up in there and there's no homes nearby no you're just hauling your toilet up there and dumping it and off just the side and of the... why the toilet so it was know. just so weird and we're just going this place is just a focal point for just bizarre activity obviously you know yeah so. and then we started we started hearing some strange noises out of the woods um we just this feeling of dread came over us and then we smelled what was absolutely a dead human body like we, it's i don't I, it wasn't a deer or a cow no um, i've never smelled a rotting pig before but maybe that was that but yeah um it just smelled like a dead human body left in the heat maybe. yeah so. yeah and it was awful so at that point 
we do we did what we normally wouldn't do normally we'd be like let's do this you know but all i could imagine we're up in the mountains we're far away from we have no cell phone signal we have nothing we have no we're very very far up there we don't know anybody in this area we don't know a lot about this area this was kind of us going out there on a whim um all i could see was that those people that drove past us would just we'd come back to our car and it have no tires, no windows, yeah, no that's anything. Yeah, we about, being able because to get we, out of there. we're just a couple of you know douchebags in a Subaru up on the side of the mountain, you know. Um, so we were like, okay, something is really not right. Time to trust our gut. We we've got to go. So we turned around. We turned around and left. Yeah. Yeah. So. We walked back to the car and we left. We're gonna we're gonna go back. We're gonna try it again, but we're gonna be a little more prepared for what we go into next time. Um, but sometimes you have to kind of know when to fold them. You know, you have to <laughs> walk yeah. away. Um, That's the only time we've ever we drove like six and a half hours. Yeah. To get there. Yeah. And, and then we we're like, yeah, no, we're and not. And then gonna just drove this. back. We were just like, yeah, there's no way to do this because there was, there's no way that we could leave the car there knowing that there were just just these people that just again like i said you could just look at them and just go these people are up not up there's no camping up there there's no hiking up there um the only human activity we're seeing are empty pet carriers that were brought up people spray painting occult symbols yeah whoever's dropping those toilets (laughs) up there um and it just it's just so weird and you're looking and like i said again the fact that all that logging equipment was just abandoned, abandoned up there yeah. and you're looking at it going there's there's so much money right here even if they just just get the trucks out of there mm-hmm. you know and they'd obviously been up there for so long at this point man. yeah so um so it was definitely time to go so we left um and that was uh, that's been the end of our corpsewood manor you know we've not been back since then uh we're planning on going back because i really want to go check it out we really... just got to figure out the logistics on it on yeah. how we can make sure that the vehicle will be so safe so if you're one of our viewers and you live in the area of somerville georgia and you are not a crazy person get in touch with us get in so. touch with us well we'd like to talk to you we will vet you because we want to make sure that you're not a toilet dumping <laughs> a toilet dumping so. satanic uh, animal sacrificing psycho but um yeah we we wouldn't mind having somebody else kind of join us and go up there and kind of um you know be our backup we really it's just the two of us that do this so it's it's nice if we could find somebody that would kind of um be our backup on on some projects so um, yeah and you know and it's weird because as we've looked at them there was just a lot of just kind of low-key and high-key weird things about that area um, oh yeah i was seeing that the local you know the nearby wildlife management area they've seeded it with deer a few times and then it's just like all the deer are gone again so the hunting is like terrible up there and then they keep finding like dead bodies that are dumped up there yeah um, and again when we say dead bodies are dumped I, some of these are not you know Bill went hunting and never came home, and then we found his body. Some of these people were obviously involved in criminal activity and then were just dumped up there. But there's just, it's obviously because that place is just so remote, hard to get to, and then no one's ever up there unless you're up there for nefarious purposes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we saw online where other people have gone to this because it's a fairly well-known thing uh, with like you know kind of more dark thrill thrill seekers yeah and all yeah that. and people had gone that they were going oh we went up there during the daytime and it was okay and you know we took some photos you can find pictures of it online yeah there's like a goth girl who did like a prom shoot there which is yeah hell yeah girl. but i mean i guess maybe it was just the time of the year we went because they were obviously people up there and it was starting to get dark too we were going to yeah. be up there at night we were going to do like a night investigation around there um, but yeah, it was just, it was next level. So we were like, okay, we're gonna, mm-hmm. we're gonna, we're gonna walk out on this one. So, but we'll, we will go back to that. I just thought that was a funny, interesting little tidbit there. Um, so we, that's not the only time we've dealt with being in the woods and dealing with occult activity. So this is in an area that's what, this is a different story in a different area, but this is miles away from this. So it's like, there's something about, North Georgia. <laughs> yeah, but it's nowhere near close. I mean, we're talking four hours away. From yeah, so there's, I don't know what it is. The backwoods cults of North Georgia are really, really active. But there's an area that we have been researching in for a long time. It's featured in a bunch of our videos. Um, 
where we've experienced occult activity and then we have witnesses who told us about mm-hmm. witnessing di- directly witnessing occult rituals in that area so if you'll remember from our episode dark side of the mountain uh hexes and handprints those are all from the same area and this is the area i'm talking about um uh, behind our tent in hexes and handprints we find what looks to be a a sigil of sorts a hex mark uh created out of sticks on top of a pile of mud with a handprint in the middle and it absolutely looks like witchcraft it looks like um it looks satanic or or it it looks like it is it is definitely ritualistic for sure and that flipped us out for sure it was um we both were like this is like some Blair Witch stuff so well we went up there originally again because this is an area that has a lot of reports of Bigfoot activity oh yeah that's that's originally why we went up there we had been investigating in an area a few miles from there before and it seemed like almost overnight all the activity in this particular area dried up Mm -hmm. so we go out and start exploring and find this network of old logging roads again which is kind of our bread and butter nowadays yeah it is like unmaintained logging and um just forestry service roads so we went up there and we find all of those notes that that girl has left yeah yeah um i'm not gonna get super into that because that's that's a that's a project we're kind of working on but i'll give you guys kind of the short of it this uh young lady went up there and had written on notes and put them on trees and i was like god that's a very distinct name and And it's in the middle of nowhere in the middle of nowhere we had cut up the side of this hill that there's no trail on. yeah and there was a name written on it that was very distinct so i was like okay when we get out of here i'm gonna google that name and see if there's anything online about it because it looked fairly fresh it was up there so we get back into cell service range and i googled the name and it came up and there you know there's posts about it this girl had been talking about what had happened and um so i read the story about what happened between these two and this girl's looking for her boyfriend so they were in high school uh he had gotten her pregnant and they had a child and his parents did not approve of the girlfriend so his parents actually uh, pretty much kidnapped him and took him took his laptop away took his cell phone away and put him in what's known as a wilderness therapy camp and this girl tracked down that he was in these woods at the wilderness therapy camp so she went up there she gathered a bunch of people up and they went up there they had like cult deprogrammers with them yeah they had a cult deprogrammer with them and everything because a lot of these uh wilderness therapy camps are basically cults um a lot of the people that go through that end up joining it as volunteers and it's just weird when you see them afterwards yeah it's a very weird like brainwashing system but um you know just as an aside about these wilderness therapy camps um when you have uh what we would call wayward youth uh we have kids that act up or their parents are disapproving of their you know even if it's something just as minute as a video game addiction a lot of these wealthier parents and um you know a lot of these parents will just send their kids to these wilderness therapy camps and at these camps it says oh you can go into the woods you camp you disconnect and your your kid you know learns survival skills and all this stuff that's how it's built but with some of these camps and um i think they put paris hilton in a camp similar to this <laughs> in uh, provo utah but um these wilderness therapy camps what they do is they try to deprogram these kids and brainwash them and um they put them in the woods with no tents they give them a tarp to sleep under they barely give them any food and it's basically just like a it's it's like a pow camp for kids you know they're out in the elements they do this in the winter as well Uh, we've actually seen them up there Mm -hmm. in the winter underneath just tarps and it's below freezing and these kids are just sleeping on the ground under tarps and it's really disturbing stuff um but there's a lot of stuff there's a lot of resources online where you can check out where people are victims of these camps that they you know they talk about what they experienced at these wilderness therapy camps and it's horrific it's worse than a lot of you know like supernatural horrors it's man-made horrors beyond your own belief (laughs) So. so um yeah so that's that kid was at that camp and so we start talking. So I, I decide to message this girl and ask if she found her boyfriend. She actually gets back to me. I didn't expect that. She gets back to me and she's like, no, we've not located him yet. We tried to go up there. We tried to find him. 
Um, but they said, did you hear the voices? And like, I didn't even tell her what we do. I never mentioned what we do at all. And we're like, mm, what, do, what do you mean, the voices? The She's, spirits of the, the woods. The spirits of the woods is what she said. Um, so she starts talking about all this stuff, like all of the supernatural stuff going around. Stuff that we've experienced up there, the yep. lights, the Prior voices, to this conversation, so. yep, lights, voices. We hear like disembodied voices all the time up there. And we're like, okay, all right. These are like normal people experiencing this. So we... Um, we actually do a little interview with her and she has one of the uh, wilderness therapy camp survivors with her doing an interview with us and he drops a bombshell on us he said that he walked up into this clearing and when they were looking for the kid um, but he had been out there he, he walked up into a clearing and he saw a group of people in robes in a circle surrounding a young girl in the middle who was crying and on her knees and all these people in robes and masks were standing around her so they were performing some kind of occult ritual at this place um, and we've actually been to that clearing before in when the hunter becomes the hunted that episode i actually sit there in the dark in that clearing where that incident took place and that's where i get those eyes behind me so and we found jewelry we in that found area. Broken, women's broken women's jewelry. women's jewelry out there in the middle of the woods um we've we've found small like child's footprints in the middle of the winter if you watch our videos too that's the area that we've mentioned more than one occasion just one of us before we heard this story we would stop and go i just feel like we're going to walk around a corner and find a dead body here yeah it's we just mentioned the that air a lot charged there yeah so. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So we have a, you know a direct eyewitness telling us that that they walked up on a cult activity going on in this area. Now, aside from that, we have experienced insane supernatural type activity and what would be considered Sasquatch activity in that area. Um, heard strange noises, We've um, experienced what voices. Could possibly be dogman activity. We've in that experienced area. possible dogman activity in that area. It's just there's a, some kind of evil there. But what I'm trying to figure out is, is that evil inherent to that place? Um, was it there and it drew these occultists there to start their rituals? Or is them practicing their rituals bringing in this evil, bringing in, you know, are they opening a door? Are they opening that door to, to this demonic almost force? And now we're getting all this activity because they've opened that door to the other well, you know, stories up in that area go back for as long as there's been people in the country to report it. So I think there's always been something going on up there. But it, like you said, it's a chicken or the egg thing. Oh, yeah. Did these people come up there and then maybe the negativity of the area influence them? And they start getting involved in this stuff? Yeah. Um, or did they already come up there like this and what they're doing is kind of acerbating the activity that was already going on up there so because that's not a good place i mean we've said that repeatedly on there you know, no and not that's, a good place that's where we uh, we've experienced a lot of orbs and floating lights and um that's where we actually got that report from one of our viewers who we are still waiting on him to get back to us um about the screaming lights and people going missing. Mm -hmm. So that place is, that place is like wicked. I mean, it's wicked. There's something real. Well, as far as like cult activity goes, what was the name of that group? The Living Light? Oh, Rainbow Children of Living Light. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that was, um, that's a like a hippie group. I mean, they're still around. They've been around since the 1960s and there's still a thing. Um, it's mostly in the West, but they did have a gathering in that area. And a lot of times they'll go into national forests and it's like a hippie gathering that goes on for about a week or so. But hasn't it gotten darker over the last? It gets real like dark, yeah. Because so you have a lot of these people who will yeah. go into the forest and be a part of this um, kind of gathering thing. And they get together, they have their campfires, they beat their drums, they smoke a lot of a lot of weed and drop acid and eat mushrooms and all that stuff. But a lot of times when you have marginalized people like that, and people who are f on the fringe, they will really go off the deep end um, when substances are added to their uh, situation. So there were instances of a lot of uh, sexual assaults. There was a murder or two. 
Uh, people it, that have gone missing, but supposedly people go, were have gone so. missing that who were attending. So it, I don't think they're allowed to come up there anymore. But it, it got out of hand, and so mm-hmm. like that imprints on the land too. So you've got this occult activity, you've got these murders, you've got um, a possible serial killer was hiding out up there. Gary Wayne Hint. Hinton, Henson? I don't know. Was, uh, um, supposedly was hiding out up there for a while. So Yeah, so it's, um, it's this area is really active, um, but it's really active. And you, the, I've been working on a project where I found um, that there's been a lot of missing people there. There have been uh, uh, body parts found in there. Um, it's just a, it's a really, really shocking kind of like amalgamation of phenomena that goes on there and then all this human activity that seems to be feeding into whatever this dark phenomena is. And you know, the uh, the wilderness therapy thing, there's a, quite a few kids that have gone missing from that particular area yes. and they just chalk it up to all they ran away. And the, the witnesses that we talked to said, no, that they, they're about 90% sure that one of the kids that went away died up there in one of these rituals and they covered it up claiming that she drowned that she got into yep. so there's a real small waterfall up there yeah and that she had gotten under the waterfall and drowned and they said that they had uh that basically she had died in one of these rituals or they did it to, to silence her to cover it up and they said that there's a lot of that that particular therapy group has a higher than usual number of kids that just go missing that yep. are never found that they just chalk it up to running away so yep. and you ain't running away from that area up there that area is difficult to get out of a lot of those survivors will tell you that you know if you start to if you're one of the kids that tries to run away they'll take your shoes away um just real dark stuff real dark stuff so uh your kids acting up don't send them to a wilderness therapy camp yeah don't send them because now at least two or three times we have found a huge number of instances of like strange phenomena around these wilderness therapy areas and i'm still of the idea that even if there's no a i think that i think the more that we delve into this we're going to find that there's more and more occult activity that goes that takes place in these wilderness therapy oh places. for sure but even if there's not there's just so much suffering of like young kids that goes on there that's got to charge the area negatively well if you think yeah. about like poltergeist activity that happens around you know kids who are going through puberty or uh, stressful situations or stressful situations yeah. that poltergeist activity really ramps up around a kid going through puberty and mm-hmm. so you got these kids who are teenagers they're going through puberty they're going through a, um, a really difficult time and we talk about this from time to time that I don't think that paranormal activity and, you know, demonic or ghost activity or anything like that is restricted to houses. You know, it's not just a haunted house. It's the woods are haunted, you know. Um, so what's to say that this kind of negative thing going on to these kids, these kids are going undergoing a lot of stress. A lot of them are going through puberty. Um, it's a very, very difficult, sad, just horrible situation. And all that energy is just supercharging. All, all that energy yeah. is just feeding into whatever is kicking up up there. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, I, I absolutely think that's what's going on. You know, and it's weird, too, to think that... Uh, some of the and i'm sure that there's some wilderness therapy camps out there that are not traumatic or not involved in dark stuff you know that ain't killing kids but you know? it certainly seems the way that way around here and are these people drawn to these sorts of pro to be involved in these sorts of programs because they're already inclined to be involved in occult activity or are they just kind of drawn into it once they're a part of this you well know, so. i mean you've got people who are i mean you know it's it's personality types or predisposition to joining cults and being you know suggestive and things like that so maybe it's the people who are like that they can kind of be brainwashed and then drawn into a cult and then you know do horrendous things but then justify it you know yeah and it's weird too because you'll see i mean you can find like message boards facebook groups and everything like that of people that were involved in these wilderness therapy things and even if they come out not saying that they were subjected to any sort of like occult practices they still don't have anything nice to say about the place oh, and for still, sure. they still talk about the abuse that they did it's right out there in the open and nobody pays any attention to it so there could be kids out there going yeah they pulled me out of my tent and they took me into the woods and they did this ritual and are you really going to believe this messed up kid yeah. you know it's just their story is going to be just shoved to the side and, and just marginalized so yeah 
Well, that's a bummer for today. Yeah, and you know, and I think it goes beyond that too, because I think that there's, especially what we've seen up in that same area, there seems like there's ongoing occult activity that's maybe been practiced for generations. For longer there. than that. Yeah. Um, I think what that, that symbol behind our tent, I don't think that was just people running around the woods. I think that was, yeah. in a way, I think that was something older, something darker. Um, and I don't want to say like an elemental or something like that, but some dark ancient witch of the woods or something like that, you know? Um, I know that seems like a bridge too far in a way, but... Yeah, but you get these people. I mean, if you're... Even if you live in a city in this region and you've lived in this area your whole life, or maybe you even live in like a, a suburb in this area, um, you don't really know how remote some of these mountain communities are. And oh, it's yeah. lessened a certain extent as the population's grown in this region. But I mean, we go into some areas that you can tell they don't want they don't want us there. You know? right. And we're not exactly like, you know, big city slickers or anything like that. Both of us have grown up in small southern towns in the mountains. Um, but you get these things up there and, you know, it's it's weird because I remember being a, a kid, my grandmother taking me back home to West Virginia and we went to like a snake handling church oh. and it was it was weird. You know what I'm saying? I mean, even yeah. even then on its face, it was Christianity. Some of the practices that you'd hear about were not normal Christian practices. Um and I know it kind of smacks of like the old gods of Appalachia, you know, type stuff, but it would not. Yeah. It just, it seems like there's evidence that there's people up there whose families have lived in this particular spot. Nobody new moves in. Nobody moves out. Um, sure, they might come to town for groceries every month, but the rest of the time, there's no phone up there. There's no internet. I mean, there's no cell signal for most of the places yeah. we're in up there. Yeah. Um, and these kind of strange beliefs could kind of just endure up there you know these strange practices i mean i mean we uh we found that weird stone pillar with that dead snake on it we parked next to the stone pillar and came back and somebody had left the snake there yes that yeah that, um, that reeked of just some sort of occult warning i mean that was not yeah i sort of had normal. i sort of had footage of that our camera completely malfunctioned in that that night um it, actually katie katie was out with us katie's a fellow investigator she works with us sometimes um, she does a lot of uh, she does a lot of ghost type paranormal type investigating, so we bring her on when we have cases that are more attuned to that because she's she specializes in that. Um, but she was with us that night, and we were at an old homestead, and we were just investigating it. We got out there, and there is this stone pillar with a copper head on it that's dead just like on top of it that had been almost posed on the it was top like of placed it, so. there it was so weird it was so weird and all of our cameras and everything malfunctioned that night um like the sound went out on our cameras so i mean a lot of that footage that i got was completely unusable um it was yeah that was that was a weird night. but i don't think that that was a Sasquatch or a dog man or no, even like I, a wood I, spirit that looked as if a person had put that it's a stone pillar with a dead copperhead arranged on top of it you yeah know? um and that's as the crow flies like what like uh 10 miles from yeah. where all this occult activity yeah. that we're talking about right now actually took place so well like i said I, I think that if you if you you're not exposed to it you just think that it just seems impossible that in 21st century america people could still be practicing stuff like this and we're not even really talking about you know like the that vampire cult that was in the lbl that was just a bunch of kids who were um you know more along the lines of like D, &D satanism you know and listening yeah. to heavy metal albums that just they got out of control and killed people um this just seems like it goes deeper and it's more structured you know, you, what, I'm saying? You know what this reminds me of um a, when we went to lost cove Lost Cove's weird, man. Yeah, so Lost, Lost Cove, Cove is, is a it's a it's a ghost town in North Carolina. Um, we're actually gonna do an overnight there, I think. But this yeah. reminds me of Lost Cove. There's some, some of that strange graffiti, graffiti out there. There's there's graffiti on some of the buildings that still stand out there. That and you have that footage still, don't you? I do have that footage. Yeah. Some of that graffiti was not just some again, just nothing against metalheads, but not some small town metalhead teen writing like Slayer lyrics on a wall. Some of that graffiti was really 
it seemed to me to be very sophisticated and it was very dark and yeah. it seemed like it was somebody gloating about the things that they had done and it yeah. just it really to this day really struck with me um, i do have that footage yeah. um it's not great because it was really early on when we first started recording and and filming everything that we do but we um I still have all that footage that we we got from that. Um, I'm thinking about as before I started, it's before I learned how to taught myself how to edit. But I'm thinking about releasing some of that old footage, edit it together. Now that I know how to kind of edit, um, edit it together and kind of do some from the archives stuff, like Helmet Holler from the archives, because that was some weird footage yeah. that we got there. Because Lost Cove, we got that graffiti is very strange. Um, I was I was attacked by a rabbit, which is kind of funny. <laughs> um, then we also have like we got spook lights that just are responsive to us, yeah. um, and that was wild. So I think then you guys let me know, like comment and let me know if you guys want me to do um, a from the archives type thing where I take old footage that was never released and I edit it together and kind of release it to you guys. Um, if you guys would like to see that, uh, just let me know, like comment and let me know. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to do it if you guys are willing to watch it. Um, but yeah, it's just hard to believe that there's there's that kind of activity going on up in the woods. But in addition to that kind of activity remaining in pockets in the woods, there's also people remaining in these pockets in the woods. Yeah, before we jump into that, I wanted to, I'm kind of getting off our my prepared stuff here. Okay. Um, and you'll have to help me flesh this out, but one of the things when you talk about these these cults, um, we had some of that take place down in Louisiana. Remember the basis for True True Detective? The that, King in Yellow stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was actually a church down there that was, um, there was a church that uh, turned out that all of the, the senior officials of the church were involved in satanic worship and oh. had been involved for multi-generational. Um, it had been going on for a while and they were, um, they were, you know, involving the kids. This was not satanic panic sort of stuff. This right. was stuff that the church got shut down. People were arrested, went to jail. Um, and it was weird because I didn't even really hear about any of it at the time um, when it happened. But it's... Uh, I'm pulling it up here real quick. But yeah, there was that church, uh, the satanic... Yeah, there was a satanic sexual abuse case in the early 2000s um, down there. But there was a cult activity going on in this small town, and nobody said anything about it because a lot of the, the prominent figures in the town were involved in it. Yeah, yeah. So you get these small rural towns, and if something's going on, I mean, there's rumors in Somerset uh, in Kentucky that you yeah, hear about. With yeah, yeah. Like, with some of the police department being involved in occult activity. Yeah, they kind of glossed over that in Hellier. I was just like, we're watching Hellier, and I love how they put Hellier together. But then, like, on season two, they go to Somerset, and the guy's like, oh, well, there's this, you know, occult activity, and then this, and this, and this. And, like, I'm watching it, and I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then they just go, whoop, the opposite direction. I'm like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You've been given this nugget of this insane story. Why don't you follow that lead? Well, it's because they're they're basically ghost hunters, so they're going to kind of follow the that more lead. and more of the, that kind of lead. Yeah. Where we're crazy redneck, you know. <laughs> Stuff we would veer towards that. Uh, the Hosanna Church in Tangipo Parish is Tangipoa. where that happened. Yeah, um, Tangipo. Tangipo. Tangipo is how I always pronounce is it. it down there. We live down there. Yeah. I live down there. Tangipo, for ten... Tangipo Parish. So <laughs> I lived anyway, down there for ten years. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they they had an actual satanic ritual going on that was supported by the church at that point. So huh. and I totally forgot about that until just now. But they had. Um, a youth hall that was like locked away where they would just do these, and I'm talking full on rituals, robes, you know, pentagrams on the floor. There were, there were rumors that they had killed drifters down there. They didn't kill anybody from the community, but there was a, like a lot of like child sexual abuse that would go on. And these children had been raised, the people that were doing it when they were arrested had been brought up in this satanic cult as children. And their parents had been involved with it. So that was just this multi-generational. So if that's going to happen in a small town, you think it's impossible to happen in some of these small little, like, Secluded insulated, like, mountain communities mountain at that point? Yeah. So, yeah. But anyway, sorry to kind of that's go off okay. on all that field on that. But uh, 
you were we were segueing into the feral people yeah night, i mean so. so yeah i mean and some of this is kind of connected because a lot of these feral people that they're finding out in the woods it, it seems like they're almost like a cult in a way. yeah but you know when you think of cult activity you think of more normalized Organized. people that live in an area that could that still like go down out of the mountain into the store mm-hmm. and they pay their taxes and it's just but that's just a hidden facet of their life yeah um the feral people phenomenon it's just these people are just a step above animals in most case or they're they might somewhat have the trappings of civilization but they are just completely cut off they might as well Mm -hmm. be a lost tribe and you know the brazilian rainforest at this point you know Uh, and when they do interact with quote unquote normal people it's just usually not good um you know where that came on everybody's radar was the Dennis Martin case. Um, yeah, so that's one of uh, that's one of the more famous cases in the Missing Four One One series. All right, everybody, take your shot. I mentioned Missing Four One One. Yeah, that's one of the most famous cases. That's the one that's referred to most often when it comes to David Pilate's Missing Four One One series, and, and that's that happened in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Yeah, back in nineteen sixty nine, it happened. Um, and people have done exhaustive shows on this. We're not going to go into the yeah. whole like details of it, but um, basically, when Dennis Martin went missing, um, you know, there was a huge search. You know, a huge search. Like right before we started recording this, I was just kind of going through um, the documents that the people that were in charge of the search had drawn up that just give a day by day accounting and the level of highly skilled people in the level of equipment that they tried to bring to bear there. Um, you know, you always hear about with missing 411 cases, uh, strange weather moving in, which that happened uh, right after Dennis Martin went missing. They had two and a half inches of rain, lots of flooding. Um, and then one of the things that jumped out to me is, is they tried to bring in search planes, helicopters, all that, and then just almost every one of them like had some sort of malfunction that took place. They, I was reading about how they were modifying a plane to have a large loudspeaker. Okay. And they were going to have um, Dennis Martin's father, like a recording of him playing over this loud loudspeaker, telling Dennis to move towards a particular area or give instructions for him to kind of help himself be discovered. Yeah. And as it was landing to be fitted for the speaker, one of the landing gear snapped so they couldn't use it so this was just a repeated thing that was going on but um something that came out is there was a guy named harold key who was a a visitor to the park uh once he heard about dennis martin going missing got in touch with him going hey listen my family and i were were nearby there we were out they were out viewing wildlife and they heard this horrible scream and saw what he described as a hairy man with what looked like a small child in red, which is what Dennis Martin was wearing, over his shoulder, and he was trying to not be seen. Yeah. Um, as if he was trying to avoid being seen by their family. Um, and a, a lot of people have just have kind of drawn parallels between that and just Sasquatch. It's Sasquatch that took them. But he seemed like he was pretty adamant, and that was just a, a hairy, kind of disheveled, unkept person. A wild man. A wild man. Yeah. And then that's what started up all of the the stories about feral people and the national parks uh especially in the smoky mountain yeah area. there was a uh, trend on tiktok recently where people were talking about feral people in the national park specifically the great smoky mountain national park um and that that drew a lot of attention to this concept and this this whole idea um because of course it's on tiktok everybody watched mm-hmm. it but um they actually, there was an episode of American Horror Stories that it pretty much mirrors the Dennis Martin story. The family loses their kid, and it's all kind of, a mm-hmm. lot of that's drawn from this. So there's a lot of um, interest in it, and there's a lot of things kind of in the zeitgeist right now with that's looking at feral people in these national parks. And there's a whole theory that there's feral people living in these national parks, and that there's a containment zone within the national parks that the government knows about. Um, where these people are living, and they send in kill teams when they get well, yeah, that out goes of in hand. The the green berets that they had, you know, there were green berets that were on a training maneuver nearby. That they there was like 500 people involved in this training maneuver, and they brought I think like 60 or 70 out to help look for Dennis Martin. Um, but they took a particular air, area of the search grid, 
and they just said that the park rangers and the other rec- and when i read it i mean there were boy scouts park rangers ranger cadets um search and rescue both volunteer but now volunteer search and rescue in that area is pretty good man yeah. you know um but it was all it wasn't just a bunch of people from like nearby neighborhoods out there beating the bushes these were all trained search and rescue guys and the green braves were basically just like we'll take this area now the area that they took they actually had a psychic a, a woman who claimed to be psychic that had given some tips in the past that turned out to be true and she had said, you need to search this particular area. And that's where the Green Braves went. We'll handle this area. You guys stay out. Um, and they went in. And now there's a rumor that uh, the Green Berets were going in there because the government was aware of, of what happened to this kid, especially after they heard the story from um, Harold Key about seeing somebody carrying him over his shoulder. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a rumor that one of the military men told one of the park rangers that were involved afterwards, we took care of what snatched Dennis. Yeah. Um, and there was a rumor that they had actually found several sets of physical remains, including clothing that, that they thought might have belonged to Dennis Martin, and that that's what the Green Berets were there for, to basically come in and, and take care of that. And there's rumors going around online that um, there's people who have lived in that area for decades and that back in like the 30s and 40s when they were starting to form it that they would hire some of the locals um to go in and basically thin out the population of these feral people that were up there and that especially some of the uh you know because this area this general region um this, these are the people who fight the wars for america through here you know what i'm saying you know the the percentage of volunteer for um, volunteers for the military come from this area. So there were a lot of like returning World War II vets and that some of these were returning World War II vets came there and basically, you know, came back home, but then they were contacted by the government going, hey, we, we want you to go in and try to keep the numbers down. Um, that they had tried to go in in the past and wipe them out entirely, but they couldn't. So they were basically just trying to, to keep them within the bounds and to kind of keep them from causing a stink in these national parks. Yeah. So, and you know, one of the rumors that you, or one of the, the trains of thought is that you always hear about is, well, you know, they, they don't want it told because they don't want to ruin tourism in these areas. And I always have a, let's go back and forth on that because if you remember the logging industry got just decimated by the spotted owl, remember? I mean, yeah. that cost a lot of money. Um, or if you find like a rare plant in an area, yeah, you can shut so, down an entire I mean, uh, logging operation. And so that's something with millions of dollars behind it. Yeah, so I just, I've never thought that the, the tourism dollars were behind why they would not cut these areas off. I think it's just maybe because it's such a large reason, region, they know they can't quarantine it out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So they just try to cover it as best they can. And at this point now, I think maybe that if this is true, the story's been there for so long what are they going to do now they're going to come out and go all right well yeah i mean there are feral people here and yeah this is what's happened to a lot of these missing people um they're not ever going to come forward and and tell the truth on that that would incriminate them horribly that they'd held that secret for so long and let people go into these areas and be taken after all these people get murdered and go missing yeah i think that'd be a bit of a pr nightmare and you know again it goes back to the same thing with the occult activity that if you and people will go, oh, we go to the Smoky Mountain National Park all the time. That couldn't happen. If you do go, you're probably limiting yourself around structured camping areas, around hiking trails, mm-hmm. around tourist areas up there. Um, there's so many thousands of miles of just terrain up there that doesn't really hardly ever see anybody, you know. Um, one of the theories was is that these were people um, from – around the time that the parks were settled and people who were driven off their land had basically snuck back in to live on their land. Or gone deeper, yeah. Yeah, and then just they've just stayed up there and then they had children and then those children had children and they've never been to school. They've never really been outside of that wooded area and they've been taught to stay away from outsiders. I mean, you'd go feral in a generation or two. Or that theory about like Civil War soldiers who never, yeah, yeah, never yeah. quit the, never, you know, quit the war. Like the Japanese soldiers on those islands on the, on islands, the Pacific, yeah, yeah still fighting just, the war. Um, but I mean, especially these areas that are that are 
there's some really poverty stricken areas in Appalachia that just don't really see any outsiders because nobody wants to fool with it. Right. You know? Um, you know, and I just think that that it's really not a, a stretch that, you know, some of these areas have like extremely, you know, just shockingly bad like birth defects from inbreeding. Um, again, nobody's moved there new. The gene pool has remained stagnant. Um, you know, and one of the things that, you know, you talk about with these feral people uh, that are seen are just the birth defects that seem to be apparent on them and how they just seem kind of malformed yeah. in a certain way. So, um, also, ac- not and not having access to you know modern medicine and everything would probably be a, a real problem there too. Yeah, but I mean, um, it's just... you fall and break your arm, you know, you have to let it heal how it is. You yeah, know, there there yeah. might be you know deformities that result from something like that, but definitely the inbreeding is going to do it too. You know, well, there's something that kind of bridged the gap between the the occult stuff and the the just the feral people phenomenon is that I had seen remarks from people. That they were talking about around in Gastonia, North Carolina, Kings okay. Mountain. I saw, a, and it might have been the same person making these comments under different usernames across different forums, but people talking about how there were hunters up there that got, that they were up just deep in that area. And now that area also has a lot of Bigfoot encounters. So yeah, maybe we, the Bigfoot we've encounters. Gotten, we've gotten reports of yeah. dogman encounters around Kings Mountain. Yeah, like a so, lot. But they said that they were were deep in the woods looking for a hunting spot. Um, he was a little shaky on whether they were supposed to be there or not. So I don't know if maybe this is land that they had uh, access to or maybe they were poaching. But they said that two guys came out of the bushes wearing what they described as almost like homemade clothing um, and were just yelling gibberish at them. And they didn't have any shoes on. He said they looked like the people that you would see in... What's that horror movie where the teens end up on the... Wrong turn. Wrong turn, yeah. So, uh, But he had mentioned that horror movie that they just all looked deformed almost to a certain extent. So he said they started hightailing it back to their their vehicle. And then when they got there, this pickup truck pulls up that he said looks like it's cobbled together out of spare parts. And it's just filled with people in the back, you know, six, yeah. eight people that all look deformed to a certain extent and that they're the guy there was an older guy driving yelling at them through the window and they just peeled out of there that's like our corpsewood manor encounter yeah, yeah it's, well that's what made me think about it is is that some of these areas you might have you know maybe the the mother and father figure and they've had children um and then maybe those children have inbred with one another so maybe you've got some that are capable of going out into you know civilization and then those that just kind of stay up there and just get wilder and wilder and wilder i mean the sawney bean clan you know from like the 1600s which is what the hills have eyes were based on that was a couple who basically went into this cave system up there to live um had kids the kids had kids they were all breeding together and there were like 50 of them when it was all said and done and they were living by attacking travelers and eating them you know and the the two original parents would still take the jewelry and everything like that and would go into different towns every once in a while and trade it for stuff but the kids but were just like the kids never left and the feral. kids got wilder and wilder and wilder and i mean eventually they they had to take um nobody had searched the caves up there they knew travelers were going missing and people from like the surrounding communities but they figured that the caves that nobody could live there and yeah. it wasn't until they actually brought soldiers in and they had um, tracking dogs that they tracked him up to this cave and they came in and it's just filled with like you know the remains of dead bodies old clothing and just this 50 person inbred family that had been attacking people because so, they're all they've all got the shakes because they got the prions you know probably yeah you start so, up, but, i mean could you tell at that point because i mean you yeah. know it's it's apparently just every generation that would happen up there they would just start breeding with each other as soon as they they were old enough so i mean so that's that's happened now could that happen to that extent I'm not going to say that it couldn't because, again, some of these areas people don't go into. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have people who maybe leave the city who go up to some of these, you know, mountain areas and all that to, to kind of look at the wildlife or watch the leaves change in the fall. Some of these areas are 
are sketchy, man, you know, and mm-hmm. people are just going to drive on through. You and know? you you hear, I mean, there's a lot of stories about hermits, about, you know, just singular men going out into the woods and like living out their lives alone. Like you hear the hermit stories a lot, but this is like, this is a family unit. This is something that's a small group, a community. So I guess this is what happens when it's so isolated and they return to nature in such a way. Well, maybe they've always been up there. I mean, there's the moon-eyed people. Yeah, so that's area. an old that's yeah. an old Cherokee legend is the Moon Eyed People. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Just kind of give a rundown on yeah, the Moon Eyed People. Yeah, it's just that the Moon Eyed People were a race of people that the Cherokee uh, conflicted with in this area. They lived in Appalachia. They were basically around Fort Mountain in Georgia, and the Cherokee hated them. Um, said that they were child stealers and that they would come at the night and you know take women and children from the Cherokee camps. Now, the Cherokee basically went to war with them and chased them away to parts unknown. Now, supposedly, they lived underground, so my thought was always just like they retreated underground. They didn't get chased out of that area. They just went underground for it. Um, They were described as being very pale, very small in stature, and they were called the moon-eyed children. Um, There's two different theories on that, A, because they had oversized eyes, um, the one that's more commonly accepted is that they were called the moon-eyed children because they saw better at night. They had difficulty seeing during the daytime. But this was supposedly a, a race of people. There were no supernatural attributes to them. They were just cannibals who lived in underground that came up every once in a while. So You know, I, I was thinking about the moon-eyed people not too long ago um, because they recently discovered a cave in uh in georgia i think it's in georgia right where it's deep underground and there's like some of the oldest cave paintings in north america were discovered inside this cave and i'm looking at the photos of these um cave paintings and i'm like and etchings and i'm like there are no torch marks like if you're going to be in a cave and you're a you know a prehistoric human i guess is what you would call it right I guess. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, so. um, but if it's thousands, you know, hundreds or thousands of years old, or however old these are, these cave drawings and etchings are. But um, if you're underground, you, you need light to see by. So wouldn't there be scorch marks somewhere inside this cave? These etchings and these drawings. Unless have, they're like troglodytes and they just live underground. Like, yeah. Full-time so, and, I mean, know. could this could the, this be evidence of the moon eyed people? Because there's. No scorch marks. If these etchings and drawings survived these this long, the scorch marks from the torches would survive as well. So yeah, there, would. yeah, that carbon from the the, yes, the burning so torches. There's no yeah. scorch marks inside these caves from torches. So how did these people see to get in these caves to create this art? Um, that so I was like, wow. So I'm, and I've, I've not heard anybody kind of mention that yet. And I'm like, this mm-hmm. could be evidence for what is known to the Cherokee as the Moonite people. Yeah, yeah. And again, they they followed and a lot of the stories. They followed the same mo as like the feral people in the national parks do. You know what I'm saying? And the same mo, um, the the you know special forces whatever nowadays go in and try to drive them back. Back then, the Cherokee would try to drive them back. You know. Um, so, but they never quite seem to wipe them out enough to, to make them go away. Yeah. So, which means that they've obviously got somewhere where they can retreat back to, possibly underground, to avoid being, like, found and wiped out entirely. So, pretty weird stuff. Man. What if so. the brown mountain lights are, like, the torches from, like, feral See, people? I may be, you know what I'm saying? Now, now, the lights we've seen are definitely not torches. Yeah, they're, they're definitely they not torches. They behave in a way that somebody no. on foot with a torch could, could be, but... I mean, like I said, I mean, it. if you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have just told you this. Well, I don't know. Do you know what I'm saying? Because we're, when we lived in Louisiana, there's communities in those swamps that have not seen anybody that's not a direct neighbor for 100 years. Yeah. There. And I mean, and you get into some of those areas and you can't understand what they're saying. You've got people back there that have grown up speaking you know, Cajun, Creole, you know, French down there that can't speak English, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So um, not I everybody... Mean, I, we, I, I ran into people like that in Lafayette. Yeah, I mean, know? not everybody's got smartphones and live a comfortable 21st century lifestyle. I mean, there's people in this country and these more remote areas that have just been left behind, you know? I yeah. mean, Appalachia, there's there's areas that just have... You think intercivity poverty is, like, bad... There's people that are living in like old abandoned school buses, you know, down yeah. old country roads that 
that have never seen a doctor. They've they've the only people they know are of their immediate family. And if you don't think that couldn't take a bad turn and they yeah. start, you know, picking off hikers or hunters or something like that, oh, it could easily happen. So Yeah, so that's kinda that's kinda what we worry about sometimes, you know, when you're out there kinda looking around for cryptids or uh, you're looking for Sasquatch, looking for dog man, you never know when you're gonna run across some feral clan of yeah, exactly. inbreeding inbred cannibals, so yeah cannibals with the shakes you know you never know what you're gonna find um yeah i mean and i you know maybe some sasquatch uh sightings or misidentified feral people you know there's the possibility of that that they're out there and they they're wearing skins and and maybe some of them are awful big and it's just a misidentification of these feral humans we know they exist i mean there's documented cases of people of these people existing um and, and again, it's not going to take that long to go from civilized to feral yeah. to what you would consider feral. And then if there's breeding that goes on and there's new generations being born, it's not outside the realm of possibility. Yeah, you know? it's, not, so, it's not. I mean, people can live. And wasn't there an old X-Files like that, too? Where they yeah, had, yeah. Um, actually, it was actually the Jersey Devil episode that um, it wasn't the Jersey Devil at all. Uh, Mulder. Uh, saw a young woman um in a building he was actually off the clock when he was doing this because it was you know he wasn't supposed to be doing this because the local sheriff was like no Mulder, this is not a place for the fbi <laughs> so he saw a woman digging through the garbage her partner had been killed so uh, yeah there were feral people it was a family unit that was living in the the pine barrens in new jersey they thought it was the jersey devil killing everyone but it was actually feral people in the pine barrens we well, you know when you say fbi not to switch around just because it came up to me they they, uh, one of the theories I saw in the Dennis Martin case, everybody knows that the FBI agent that was in charge of a, the FBI's efforts killed himself shortly afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the reasons I saw for that is that when the Green Berets were in killing these feral people and bringing the bodies out to kind of just obviously you don't want to leave like, you know, dead bodies inside the park in case somebody stumbles across it, that a lot of what they were bringing out were dead, malformed children from where these people had inbred. And it just horrified him to it the It horrified point. him to the point that he ended up killing himself for it. So. Well, there you go. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. On so, that bright note. On so. that bright note. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of things that go bump in the night in the woods, and you don't know if it's a feral person. You don't know if it's a Sasquatch. You don't know if it's a dog man. You don't know if it's a cult performing a ritual. But make sure if you're out in the woods that you are being safe. Make sure that you have your personal locator beacon. Um, we always go armed because we're not getting wrong turned. He'll ha- oh, he'll have eyes by a group of satanic cannibal feral people. Um and just always be aware of your surroundings and just be as safe as possible when you're out in the woods because you never know what's hiding out there behind every ridge. Um, yeah, but uh, this has been a good good talk, honestly. Um, I really enjoyed it. A little bit of it. a departure from the usual departure. stuff that yeah. we normally cover. It's, so. it's, this is definitely my department, though. I love this is my direction. This is where I like to go. Um, but, yeah, thank you guys for listening and watching. Um, as always, we really appreciate you guys. Uh, we wouldn't do this if you guys weren't watching. Um, we couldn't do this without you. You know, we, we this is why we do Dark Dive is because we want to really just have these conversations with you guys um, and and share our thoughts and, and kind of introduce some new concepts to all y'all. And uh, we really appreciate all the people who are watching and listening and downloading the episodes. Make sure that you like, share, and subscribe and turn on your notification bell. That way you know when new episodes of Hellbent Holler and Dark Dive are coming out. Um, you'll get that notification and you can run right over and watch and listen also download the episode it helps us get up there in the numbers we really appreciate that and um, leave us a review we really really appreciate those reviews you guys are awesome um, but we only accept five star reviews um, sorry for those four three twos and ones that's all we accept is five stars um, and just comment below and if you know of any kind of like cool stories about feral humans or occult activity in the woods comment below and let us know or if there's anything you kind of want us to cover or talk about on Dark Dive, you can always comment below and we'll we'll get on that. 
Um, we're going to start doing um, more live streams and stuff, I think, coming up because we just love hanging out with you guys. It's going to be a blast. So uh, keep an eye out for when we do live streams. We'll announce that via the socials and all that stuff. Um, I've got the Wild and Weird Con coming up uh, October 14th and 15th. I'm doing that night hike uh, that Friday before. So make sure you go and snag your tickets. They're very, very limited. There's going to be a campsite dinner after that. That's going to be so much fun. It's at the Chief Logan State Park, which is like a little West Virginia Stanley Hotel in, in kind of a weird mm. way. It's a really cool spot. And then the convention's the next day. That's Saturday. Um, I'll be speaking and uh, we are hammering out that that speaking engagement right now but we'll be there um i look forward to meeting everybody that comes out we're just gonna have such a good time we always love doing wild and weird con with uh joe and ron it's uh it's always a fun time um but yeah thank you guys for joining us we really appreciate you as always and this has been dark dive